Welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be heading back to the early 1970s to take a look at one of the most successful 35mm rangefinders out there, the Yashica Electro 35. So stay tuned. Way back when, let's say in the 1950s and earlier, if someone told you they were shooting 35mm film, chances are that they'd be using a rangefinder camera. Today we think of SLRs as having been around for a long time, but they really didn't come into their own until the early to mid 60s. And well, I guess that is a long time ago, but still, rangefinder cameras were around earlier than that. But even after SLRs began to take over the 35 millimeter market, there were several camera makers that continued to produce top-notch rangefinders. Some of the benefits of rangefinder cameras offered the conveniences of using 35 millimeter film, lower price points, for the most part, and simpler systems, since many would have non-interchangeable lenses. But these simpler systems would also come with their own set of limitations. SLRs became popular because they were so flexible. The ability to use wide-angle telephoto and macro lenses gave photographers a whole range of new ways to see and interpret their world. Rangefinders, on the other hand, even those that featured interchangeable lenses just didn't have that sort of flexibility. And SLR's major strength is its ability to actually see through the lens that's attached. Rangefinders, on the other hand, have to rely on the viewfinder window that's separate from the lens. And most will use frame lines in that viewfinder to show the coverage of the lens and allow for accurate composition. And since the viewfinder is a bit offset from the lens, focusing at close distances will result in what's known as parallax error, which means the image in the viewfinder can be significantly different than what the actual lens is seeing. Twin lens reflex cameras also experience this due to the separate taking and viewing lenses. And while TLRs were sort of losing popularity by the early 1970s, rangefinders were still being produced as affordable alternatives to SLRs. One company that was still finding decent success with rangefinder cameras at this point was Yashica. Yashica had been building rangefinders since 1958 with the Yashica 35, but it wasn't until they came out with the Electro 35 series in 1966 that the company had a real hit on their hands. This camera evolved through four generations up through 1973 with the Electro 35 GSN, and that's the one we have here. The Electro 35 offers the user a fully automatic exposure using an aperture priority system. It relies on a front-mounted CDS cell to coordinate the stepless, electronically controlled shutter for the correct speed. And alas, there is no option for manual exposure. Add to this the fact that this was all powered by a now obsolete mercury battery, and it sounds like a camera you might not want, but only almost because when you hold it in your hands, you recognize that it's meant to be taken seriously. And as it turns out, the battery issue is a non-issue. The solution is to use a regular A544 photo battery and an adapter. And I got this adapter from a seller on eBay several years ago. Basically, it's just a tube with a spacer at one end, to fill the space for the original battery. And with this, the camera operates just fine. Camera operation is pretty simple. There are three settings on the lens. We have B, auto, and flash. For most photography, you'll use the auto setting, and that'll give you the maximum range of the shutter with stepless speeds from 1 500th of a second all the way down to 30 seconds. The flash setting should be used when using an external flash and is actually only 1 30th of a second. And B works just like you'd expect. The shutter stays open as long as the release is pressed. The 45 millimeter lens is composed of six elements and four groups with an f-stop range of 1.7 to 16. And again, auto exposure is the aperture priority type. You set the desired f-stop and the camera will give you the appropriate shutter speed. Focusing is like other rangefinders. You'll have a secondary image in the viewfinder and by turning the focus ring, you'll bring those two images together. When they're superimposed, your image is in focus. As far as exposure information goes, there really isn't much. There are two warning lights in the viewfinder as well as on top of the camera. If you get a red light in the finder, it means that even at the highest shutter speed of 1 500th of a second, your photo is going to be overexposed. To remedy this, you just stop down and keep going until the light turns off. If you see a yellow light in the viewfinder, it means that the camera assigned shutter speed is 1 30th of a second or slower. So if you see that, you should find a way to steady the camera. 
And if you get no feedback whatsoever in the finder, it means everything is fine and that the shutter speed is going to be somewhere between 1 30th and 1 500th of a second. And as I said, you get the same lights on top of the camera too. Also on top is the film speed dial and the shutter is surrounded by a locking collar that will prevent the shutter from being pressed if it is locked. So pressing the shutter halfway will cause the yellow red lights to illuminate if there's an exposure issue. Now back to the viewfinder for a second. The Electro 35 has a parallax compensating viewfinder. So as you focus closer, the frame lines in the viewfinder will actually move and adjust. So as long as you use that frame to compose your subject, you shouldn't have any framing surprises. Now, as I mentioned earlier, non-interchangeable lens rangefinders have a certain set of problems due to their design. And Yashica, being aware of this, set out to offer some creative solutions to these specific problems. To address the non-interchangeable lens issue, they produced a set of auxiliary lenses that offer a slightly wider and a slightly more telephoto field of view. We have a wide conversion lens, we have a telephoto conversion lens, and these come together in a kit along with an auxiliary viewfinder to help you in framing. When attached, the wide angle lens is going to reduce the focal length from 45 millimeter to about 38 millimeter, and that's not that much. And the telephoto conversion lens increases the focal length from 45 to about 58, which also isn't a lot, but every little bit helps, I suppose, and at least it gives you some options. The auxiliary finder mounts in the hot shoe and has a set of frame lines marked tele and wide, and you'll use those when composing with the conversion lenses. Now the conversion lenses screw onto the front of the lens and actually change the focal length of the taking lens. And what this means is that relying on the superimposed rangefinder image to set focus won't work. What we'll have to do is use that to focus as usual, then adjust the focus based on the distance table printed on the conversion lens. So let's try that with the telephoto lens. So I'm gonna focus on something behind camera all right, and I'm going to take note at what the distance scale on the lens says I'm focused to, and it looks like about 10 feet. Now I need to find 10 feet on the conversion table printed on the lens. All right. It says if the focus distance is 10 feet, I need to set a new distance to 7. And we're doing all this referring to the distance scale on the lens. I realize that a lot of modern lenses don't incorporate distance scales anymore, which is sort of a shame because it really does come in handy sometimes. Anyway, after we've adjusted the lens to the new distance, we can use the auxiliary viewfinder to frame up the shot. The wide angle conversion lens works exactly the same way. You focus as usual, note the distance, then set a new distance based on the conversion table. Interesting concept. The other issue I mentioned earlier, the lack of the ability to close focus, was also addressed by another interesting accessory, the auto up attachment. Yeah. As opposed to the auxiliary lenses where we have to reset focal distance manually to make them work, the auto up is easy. Just attach it to the lens, and this big window is positioned in front of the rangefinder window and its magnification allows you to use the rangefinder focusing as you normally would. The difference being that you're now focusing a lot closer. And the only drawback is that since we are indeed closer, the problem of parallax error returns since the frame lines in the viewfinder can't compensate enough. So we'll use the frame of the auto up to compose instead. And if we're focused at the very minimum distance we can, there's going to be a little bit of guesswork involved in order to get the composition right. Now, I want to stress that these solutions to these common rangefinder problems aren't perfect. But I really think we have to hand it to Yashica for their effort here. They could have just said, well, there's nothing we can do about it and call it a day. But instead, they came up with these accessories to extend the camera's functionality. And I, for one, appreciate that effort. Now, let's go take this thing for a spin. All right, so I've got the uh, Shika Electro 35 rangefinder out here, and I'm not going very far for this particular part of the test. I'm just staying in my own yard because uh, I really want to test that uh, the auto up close up accessory uh, to see, you know, how close can we get? Is it sharp? Is it easy? So I've got a roll of Fuji 400 color in. I don't usually shoot much color, but this time of year, color seems to be what's necessary. So uh, let's get some shots done. So as it is, 
October, and October is the month of Halloween in the U.S., but we have some Halloween decorations. Okay, so I've got the camera set to auto, which is what should be. All right, let's get this straightened up. All right, so I'm gonna try an f-stop of f5.6 to see if that's gonna give me too slow a shutter speed. Yeah. It's telling me I'm overexposed. All right, well, let's go to f8 then. And let's do that again. We'll come back up just a little bit for this. Still telling me I'm overexposed at f8. So that doesn't seem right, but okay. All right, it says overexposed. I just can't believe that that is the case though. All right, here we go. I think I was getting mixed signals there. All right, so I'm gonna shoot at 2.8 this time. All right, so here we're going to try to get some close-ups of these flowers. Still using the auto up accessory. Still at F2.8. Let's go F4. Not quite such a close angle, maybe. F5.6 and C. See what else we've got. I'm gonna take the auto up off for just a couple of shots here. It's hard reaching for this focus ring since it's next to the camera and not at the end of the lens like normally would be. All right, so let's go back to f5.6. So we are really close here. And here we go. Again, just for good measure. All right, put the auto up back on. Try a four. You know, it's just not as easy as a SLR having to superimpose the image, but I mean, I get it. If you're just not used to it, that's the thing. Let's go that again at F2. I got the underexposure warning there. shooting at f2 and since we're so close I'm having to cheat the camera a little bit off the frame the instructions say to do that but it's sort of still a bit of guesswork all right trying to get my hand positioned so that I'm not in front of the rangefinder window
All right, that was the end of that row. Okay, so be interested to see how that comes out. We'll shoot more of this camera in another location. All right, so I'm out here again with the Yashica Electro 35 on a rather busy uh, county road today. Never have experienced this much traffic, so maybe you'll be able to hear me. I'm in an old store that I stop at every now and then to get a few photos. Um, so specifically what I want to test out here today, I want to get some shots just with the uh, Yashica without any sort of accessory on it. But then I'm thinking about trying the wide angle attachment to see how that works, because there's really only so much space for me to back up here without getting in the road, and this traffic is killer today, so I'm not going to get in the road. Um, but I think we'll be able to get quite a few shots around here. So one thing occurred to me this morning after doing those close-up shots is that the light meter is on the front of the camera, not in the lens. And I'm wearing this hat with a nice shaded bill on it. So every time I put the camera up to my face to shoot, the bill was blocking some of the light. So I don't know if that's gonna have an effect on the exposure or not. Probably, I'm gonna say it probably does, but we'll actually have to see once we get everything processed. It's a very overcast day today. Uh, I would prefer a little bit of sun, but we don't have it. Um, and I'm shooting color film for this particular episode, which is unusual for me. Uh, but I thought, what the heck, let's try it. So the first shots I'm gonna do are just the camera without any sort of added accessory. And just in case that has an effect on the exposure, I'll do my hat backwards. All right, so I'm gonna go with F8. Now I've got 100 speed film. All right, F8's too much. It's too slow, it's telling me. All right, so let's try here. This is not, this is just barely getting the front and the shot. So I'm still shooting at F8. I have no idea what the shutter speed is because this camera will not tell you. All right, so it's difficult to focus when you're shooting vertically because the images that you're bringing together are going up and down instead, then side to side. I guess that's just not a, that's not a, any, issue, it's just different. So I'm finding it easier to focus in horizontal mode and then change it to vertical. All right, I'm gonna go to F4 for this. Because it was sort of telling me that I was gonna be under, well not underexposed, but 1 30th of a second or slower. Now, I do have the tripod. But sometimes, I'm too lazy to use it. It's really no excuse. All right, F5.6 now. Now, focus horizontally. That seems to be a little easier. My hand doesn't get in the way of the viewfinder. Still at 5.6. So this is definitely one of those places where you can shoot an entire roll of film here. Uh, so next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put the wide angle uh, conversion lens on, see if I can get the entire building in the shot. Okay, so I've got the wide angle attachment on here and the viewfinder. All right, so the deal with this is when you put this on the lens, it actually changes the focal length of the lens. So your focus is normal, but then you have to use the conversion table printed on the lens to set a new distance. Sounds complicated, but we're gonna see. All right, I'm gonna frame this up to see if we even have, a, if we have the width necessary to capture the whole building.
just barely. I'm gonna have to back up some more. So even though this is wide angle, it's not terribly wide angle. All right, so I am gonna shoot at F5.6. I am bringing the images together, focusing normal. Right. Okay. So I'm looking at the distance scale and it's saying just about at infinity. All right, so at infinity, it's basically the same as infinity. No conversion is necessary. All right, focusing as usual. Recompose. Focusing as usual. Taking note of the distance scale, it's almost at infinity. Let's do something slightly different. All right, so that is at 20, 15, 20 feet possibly. All right, again, we're guessing adjustment because the camera doesn't really say. Take another one, just slightly adjust it again. There's a lot of guesswork here. All right, so now I've got the auto up on this and this is gonna let me get in a little tighter with some detail shots especially where the paint sort of peeling around the Coca-Cola logo. We're gonna get in a little closer, uh, but that's what I'm going for with this. So let's go see. Okay. Yeah, so this texture is just, it's interesting with the color. Now, how close is it going to allow me? All right, I'm gonna shoot at 5.6 again. And I'm gonna use these frame lines. When you get in that close, you're actually guessing still somewhat because you have to recompose the camera a little to avoid the parallax or to correct for the parallax error. Okay, we've got the door here. I'm still shooting at F5.6. We'll compensate just a little. All right. All right, so I'm gonna put the telephoto conversion lens on and see what we can do with that. All right, so this is gonna give me a little a tighter composition of this window over here that's sort of in the weeds that I need to crawl around in. I could obviously shoot that without this telephoto attachment, but I do want to try this out. So I'm gonna focus as usual. Make note of the distance, which is 20 feet. So if it's 20 feet, I need to change the setting to 10. All right. So that's a significant difference. All right, so let's see if this actually works. Frame it up. All right. F5.6. I am focused at 15. So I need somewhere between seven and 10 feet. And that's all I'm gonna do with that. I am going to finish up the roll 
without any other conversions. I've got about five or six more shots. Well, I think that wasn't too bad, especially the set at the old general store. The exposure seemed about right, and using the conversion lenses and close-up attachment isn't all that bad either, even though there was a bit of guesswork going on. Now, the set taken in my yard was a different story. There were some significantly underexposed shots. The lighting may have played a part in that, as it was shaded on that side of my house, but there were areas in the background that were directly lit by the sun. So I'm guessing the meter was picking up some of that, resulting in the thin negatives. The lighting at the old store was even because it was overcast, so maybe that had something to do with it, because I didn't have any exposure issues at that location. You know, at first I thought that the problem might have been the bill of my cap casting shade on the meter window, but I think that would have tended to result in an overexposure instead of an under, so I'm not exactly sure what happened with that. When using this camera in the past, I've always thought the exposures were pretty good, so I'm sure it was probably some type of user error. All in all, I think the Electro 35 is fun to use, and the accessories are nice to have since they do extend the functionality of the camera. The method of using the conversion lenses is a bit cumbersome, focusing, then using the table to adjust focal distance, but it is doable and it's not that difficult. And again, I give Yashica a bit of praise for offering those solutions. But I think the best way to use this camera is just straight up with none of the extra stuff. It keeps it simple, keeps guesswork to a minimum, and really makes for a fun shooting experience. If you are in the market for a good solid rangefinder camera, I really think you'll appreciate the Electro 35. So that wraps it up for this episode. Be sure to let me know what you think of the Electro G. I'd love to hear it. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing. The next episode will feature a nice little twin lens reflex camera from Ricoh, the Ricoh Matic 225. So I hope you'll tune in again for that one. And thanks to all of you for doing what you do to keep film photography alive and well in 2023. See you next time.